Hey, what up guys? Tone Loke here, bringing you the 2017 video game industry analysis. Now, this is a combination of a demographic plus market research analysis on several different aspects of the industry. So it's gonna be pretty cool. And if you're unaware what a demographic analysis is, it's basically a survey taken from 4,000 gaming households across the United States, in which gamers were asked a bunch of questions regarding their video game habits and attitudes. So obviously this is not 100% accurate information, however, if you're familiar with how the law of averages work in statistics, you'll know that this information is going to be pretty damn accurate. For everyone else, the goal of doing a survey is to kind of capture the pattern of the sample, which is the 4,000 people, so it represents the pattern of the greater population, the entire industry. Usually about one or 2,000 survey points is enough to do this, which means that this survey has a lot of merit. But just to be clear, take everything we talk about with a grain of salt because it might not be 100% super duper accurate. All right, so here we go. Let's dig into those numbers. So the first thing I want to do is kind of crumble away an argument that's been hanging around for a while now that says that the video game market is in decline. Many people, even the press and popular websites, have been taken to this argument, most of them pointing their fingers at GameStop and how the company is basically doomed because the market is shifting towards digital distribution, or how building PCs has just gotten straight up cheaper over the last 15 years, threatening the sales of consoles. Now while this is true, it's more of a shift in the way we consume games and the entertainment business as a whole. We like convenience and when things work together to make it easy for us to interact with them. Steam obviously was huge in this regard and still is, allowing us to basically connect with others, the markets and our PCs at the same time, something that consoles have a hard time doing. Insert the mobile games industry and this argument couldn't be any more wrong. We spend almost $25 billion per year on video game media, and the trend per year has been increasing for every single year. So don't believe anyone who says that consoles are dying or handhelds or VR is just a fad, because it's all relative and people will replace their gaming habits with the platforms that they like, not just drop them because society has told us to do so. The world has actually trained us to do quite the opposite. People playing games on their phones, their tablets, and laptops are everywhere. Esports is becoming its own national sport, and our industry honestly makes more money than traditional TV cable companies. So games are here to stay. Now just a fun fact, 80% of all video game spending is with games itself. 12% goes to hardware consoles, and only 8% goes to accessories like VR headsets, controllers, and stuff like that. Now let's talk demographics. Who actually plays video games? Well, according to this survey, the average age for a male gamer is 33 and 37 for females. I think this is gonna surprise a few people, as on the surface, I assume many would say that the average age for a gamer is much younger than that. But you have to understand that those who grew up in the 90s like me were, you know, like eight years old, and now we're a lot older. After all, the 90s was kind of the renaissance of gaming, so anyone who stuck around has bumped up the bracket for the average age of gamers. However, it should be noted that over 35% of all gamers are males from ages 35 and below. Now between all genders, 65% of all US households are home to at least one person who plays more than three hours per week of video games, and there are 1.7 gamers per household on average. That's fairly telling, I think, because for a long time, being a gamer was a negative thing. So I think as this number rises in the future, especially with the growth of the mobile gaming market, more people are going to be proud of being called a gamer. But hey, I already am. Now, before we move on, I do want to share one more piece of data that is not currently on the 2017 report, but was on last year's survey. And that's that 29% of frequent gamers pay to play online video games. I assume this number has got to go way down though, as traditional MMOs have been dying away slowly over the last three or four years. In replace of that business model did come free to play games and microtransactions, which can be models so that players can kind of pay for what they want when they want it. Now, of course, if a game is pay to win, that's a completely different story and that's bullshit. But in general, I think this shift of slicing up paywalls is honestly for the better if companies don't exploit us. All right, let's talk about sales. You may have saw this graph I used in a recent video talking about the most popular video game genres, and now I wanna to touch on the lower end genres. 
Racing games are so tricky to win people over because it's a genre that inherently cannot evolve too much. You drive a car, it's pretty much it. You know games like Wipeout can be different, but they're niche, and any game that is niche is of course risky because you never know the payoff. Other games have tried the social, kind of open world thing like The Crew, but they never seem to take off because there's nothing mechanically new in those kinds of games. I actually do like racing games quite a bit, but there's only so much they can mechanically offer, so what happens is they always seem to fall back to the arcadey racing sim like those good old Forza or GT games, because they're very good system sellers. They look good, and they show off the tech, so sadly for most people, that's where it ends. Other than that, it's pretty much what you would expect in terms of genres. The only other notable thing is that sports games have seen a 1.6% decrease in sales from 2015 to 2016. But other than that, it's pretty much what you'd expect. Next year, I would like to see them break down the genres into subgenres, so we can see how successful, let's say, the action horror genre is compared to the action third-person shooter. Now let's take a look at the distribution outlets for sales and how gamers feel about what's most important in a video game before they go out and buy it. Yes, it's true, GameStop and retail sales are in some deep, deep shit. Here's the current stock graph for GameStop. If you've studied any kind of finance, you know that a 54% decline in stock price over three years is just awful. If you really think about it, GameStop only has two things that they are desperately trying to hold on to, the used gaming markets and the population that doesn't have access to high-speed internet. Eventually, the latter will dry up and the company will go under, because they can't survive on used games alone. Now lastly, here's a fun little infographic. How many times have you heard people say graphics don't matter, it's all about the gameplay? Well, not to the average player. I think this is because games have evolved so much and our expectations along with it, and that the cost of a high-end PC is actually the lowest it's ever been. For a lot of people, including myself, we like shiny things, and we want our games to look as real as possible. It's not a bad thing as long as it doesn't jeopardize gameplay. But the most interesting metric here is that 48% report that if a product is a continuation of a game series, it will affect their decision to buy or not. This is really fascinating because it basically says, I either think that sequels are good and I want to buy more, or if it's a sequel, I think it's a bad thing and I will not buy it. So of course this opens up a whole conversation about the growing trends of sequels and if they're good for gaming, or if they're just cash grabs. If you think about any Call of Duty, any Ubisoft game, going from Battlefield 3 to 4, it's hard to quantify if a sequel actually does enough. That's because when you put out a sequel, you have to cater to the fans of the original game or you'll piss off a lot of people. But being tagged by not changing enough is equally bad, so it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of scenario. That's why sequels are so tricky. My perspective on it? You have to innovate. Take the best parts of the original game and make them better by introducing new and cool mechanics that enhance them to a space they couldn't be without the sequel. But of course, it's inherently safer to put out a sequel to a successful game than to put out a brand new IP. I think companies will always make sequels, but they do keep this in mind because we enable their behavior by mopping up every COD game as it comes out. It's the big irony of the video game market. We want new games, but half of the ones that do come out, we've already played them in some form or another in one of the first iterations. But hey, that's a topic for another video. I hope you enjoyed this small look into the window of the video game industry for the last year. I'm gonna link the full report in the description and I'll be sending the ESA suggestions for the 2018 report. So if you have anything to suggest or you wanna see, drop your comments down below and I'll consider adding them alongside my comments if they are doable. Thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up button for me and subscribe here for more of our future content. And you guys have a great day. We'll see you on our next video.